between your favorites. I thought I was your favorite. Take a fresh look at Giant's produce prices. Save on golden pineapples or jumbo cantaloupes, $1.99 each. Tonight, the new video showing the moment that 950 ton bridge collapses, at least six dead, a number that could rise as they search the rubble. And we learned one of the victims was an 18 year old FIU student. And the question tonight, could this disaster have been avoided? The mounting drama inside the West Wing, several in the president's inner circle reportedly in the crosshairs. What the national security advisor told our reporter today at the White House. Two powerful storms hitting right now, one of them tracking east. Will it grow into a fourth nor'easter and a spring slam? Sam Champion standing by with the track. Also tonight, the family kicked off a passenger plane, a little girl scared to fly, and the confrontation with the flight attendants. Plus, the ski lift disaster, the lift out of control, going in reverse, riders set airborne, slammed to the ground. This is ABC World News Tonight with David Muir. And good evening, I'm Tom Yamas, in for David, and we begin at the scene of that deadly bridge collapse in Miami. The agonizing wait for families and friends of victims, we now know a college student is among the dead. And tonight, that new video, it shows the moment the bridge came down without warning across several lanes of road, killing at least six people. Teams of investigators, emergency crews, construction crews, and engineers still on the scene. The 950-ton bridge collapsing just days after being installed. ABC's Victor Okendo at the scene for us again tonight. Traffic cameras capturing the devastating moment that Miami Bridge collapsed, trapping victims underneath. There's two cars under there. Now, more than 24 hours after that deadly collapse, we're learning about the first victim. The Miami Herald reporting 18-year-old FIU freshman Alexa Duran is among the dead. Yesterday, she was driving by that bridge with a friend when her Toyota was struck. Her friend survived. A desperate rescue mission, now a painstaking recovery amid the rubble. Our primary focus is to remove all of the cars and all of the victims in a dignified manner. To reach those eight cars pinned underneath 950 tons of concrete and steel, teams using heavy machinery to break the debris into smaller pieces. Authorities bracing to find more victims. We could assume that they're in there, but we cannot confirm identity of who's in there. So we're caught in a bad place right now. For the families of the missing, it is an agonizing wait. Jorge and Carol Fraga are looking for their uncle, 60-year-old Ronaldo Fraga. I want to find out for sure, uh, I mean, if it's him uh, out there. Tonight, investigators zeroing in on the moments before the collapse when workers performed a stress test on the bridge. If it is a true stress test, generally they're putting some load on it and uh, seeing how the bridge reacts. Senator Marco Rubio tweeting that the cables that suspend the Miami Bridge had loosened and the engineering firm ordered that they be tightened. They were being tightened when it collapsed today. All of that work done as traffic whizzed by. The bridge, still under construction, was celebrated as a feat of modern engineering, seen here being installed last Saturday in a matter of hours. Today, investigators pressed on whether it had adequate structural support. That's part of our investigation. Uh, our investigations are very comprehensive, they're thorough, and they take a while, but when we do it, we will have those answers. The Florida Department of Transportation saying that the university, which was in charge of the project, did not hire a pre-qualified company to do a secondary design check of the bridge. And a major statement there from Florida DOT. Victor joins us now from the scene of the collapse. What is the university saying about that company not being pre-qualified? Tom, the president of the university says that they're investigating, but they only work with approved and certified contractors. Also tonight, word of another victim who died here, a worker, 37-year-old Navarro Brown from another company. They tell us he was out here when that bridge went down. Tom? Victor Okendo with that sad new development tonight. All right, Victor, thank you. Now to the drama playing out at the White House. Growing questions about who is coming and going in the West Wing. Three days after the firing of Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster, VA Secretary David Shulkin, and HUD Secretary Ben Carson are all said to be on thin ice. The White House insists no one is going anywhere, at least not yet. Here's ABC's David Wright. Tonight, the White House is trying to tamp down reports of an imminent cabinet shakeup. The chief of staff actually uh, spoke to uh, a number of staff this morning, uh, reassuring them that there were uh, personnel changes, uh, 
no immediate personnel changes at this time uh, and that people shouldn't be concerned. Among the top officials whose jobs may be in danger, National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster, who's known to have a contentious relationship with the president. McMaster was at the West Wing today. ABC's Tara Palmieri caught up with him. So Everybody's going to leave the White House sometime. And are you leaving sooner or later? <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm, I'm doing my job. Today, Press Secretary Sarah Sanders specifically reassured McMaster and insisted she was doing so at the president's behest. I spoke directly to the president last night. Uh, he asked me to, to pass that message along to General McMaster. The president himself has been fueling speculation about a staff shakeup. I'm really at a point where we're getting very close to having the cabinet and other things that I want. In a week in which he fired the Secretary of State Rex Tillerson in a tweet, Trump hinted at more bloodletting to come. But there'll always be change, and I think you want to see change. And I want to also see different ideas. Taking two sentences out of the thousands of remarks that the president makes and trying to make it look like that's the entire focus of his uh, administration. He just nominated two new people to be part of his cabinet. So we are getting close. All right, David Wright joins us now from the White House, and we heard McMaster say, quote, everybody's got to leave the White House at some point, and sources have told ABC News there are some in the president's inner circle who may be in trouble of losing their jobs. Well, Tom, there's been a lot of behind-the-scenes chatter about Veterans Affairs Secretary David Shulkin, also Housing and Urban Development Secretary Ben Carson. Both have faced scandals over ethics and spending. Both have been summoned to the White House to talk about it. Also, there's been lots of speculation about the Chief of Staff, General John Kelly, although today Sarah Sanders says his job is not at risk. Tom? David Wright for us at the White House. David, thank you. Next to chilling new video from the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando. For the first time, we're seeing images inside the club as the terror attack unfolded. Gunman Omar Mateen pledging allegiance to ISIS, walking into the Pulse armed with an assault rifle, killing 49 people. The video released at trial as prosecutors try to prove Mateen's widow, Noor Salaman, played a role in the attack. We're not showing all of the images because of their graphic nature, so we do want to warn you some of the video is disturbing. Here's ABC's Lindsay Janice. Prosecutors in the trial of Noor Salman, showing jurors how casually her husband, Omar Mateen, entered the Pulse nightclub, casing it for 11 minutes. Through that doorway, a packed dance floor. Mateen then leaving the club, moving his car to a closer spot before coming back in, this time with his assault rifle, opening fire on that dance floor, then moving to another part of the club. Within six minutes, police entering through the lobby, their guns drawn. As they see the full horror inside, officers yelling to the wounded to get out if they can. You can walk. Shot fired. Mateen holding up in the restrooms for the next three hours. Outside, SWAT teams busting through an exterior wall. Shot fired north bathroom, shot fired north bathroom. Within moments, engaging Mateen in a gun battle, killing him, but not before he took 49 lives. Tom Selman denies knowing about her husband's plans. She has pleaded not guilty to obstruction of justice and providing support to a foreign terrorist organization. Tom? Lindsay Janice for us tonight. Lindsay, thank you. Overseas now in stunning new developments in a mystery death of a Russian dissident on British soil. Authorities confirming Nikolai Glushkov, you see him there, a critic of Russian President Vladimir Putin, was murdered in his home in London. Putin already blamed for the nerve agent attack on an ex-Russian spy raising tensions between former Cold War adversaries. ABC's chief foreign correspondent Terry Moran is in Moscow. Counter-terrorism police and hazmat-suited technicians swarm a home in southwest London. Another Russian victim in England, a fierce critic of Vladimir Putin. This man, Nikolai Glushkov, a former top executive at Aeroflot, the Russian airline, who fled Russia and claimed asylum in Britain in 2004, found dead Monday. Police say it was compression of the neck, strangulation, and they're now treating his death as a murder. Glushkov's killing came just over a week after Russian spy Sergei Skripal and his daughter were poisoned by a military-grade nerve agent in Salisbury, England. And today, British Foreign Minister Boris Johnson accused Putin personally in that attack. We think it overwhelmingly likely that it was his decision. 
to direct the use of a nerve agent. Russia has denied any involvement. Putin today campaigning in a lab coat ahead of Sunday's presidential vote. And State TV this week showing a fawning documentary with this exchange. What is not possible to ever forgive? Betrayal. Terry Moran, ABC News. And new developments tonight in the deadly U.S. military chopper crash in Iraq. U.S. Central Command says seven American service members were killed when their Air Force helicopter went down near the Syrian border. A U.S. official says the chopper may have hit a power line. New York Mayor Bill de Blasio identifying two of the victims as members of the FDNY, Lieutenant Christopher Raguso and Fire Marshal Christopher Zanetis. Next tonight, as we head into the weekend, the possible fourth nor'easter in three weeks waiting on the other side. Heavy snow falling across the plains, trucks sliding off Interstate 90 in Rapid City, South Dakota. And watch the snow on top of this truck clipping an overpass in Wareham, Massachusetts, knocking loose the protective netting. Let's get right to weather anchor Sam Champion, who's joining us tonight. And Sam, we're following a lot of weather tonight. We have. And just as you and I have forecasted the last three, Tom, we'll do it if this is the fourth. But let's start as we always do with exactly what we do know. Let's get to the boards. This is a storm that tonight is dropping snow in the Sierras in California and also into the Rockies. Now we have we start the maps on Monday morning, 7 a.m. The low is in Oklahoma at that point. And no matter where this storm goes or what it is on the East Coast, from Dallas to Atlanta, what I want people to understand all weekend long, this will be severe weather. And there could be some tornadoes even on Sunday, so be very careful with that. Now we go to Tuesday at 7 p.m., and you see our coastal low forming right there on the Carolinas and the Virginia, exactly as it has the past few times. This is where we've got two models to watch. One model makes it a snowmaker from Washington, D.C., all the way into Maine. The other model would pull it off the shoreline too far away for it to be a problem for the Mid-Atlantic or New England. And Tom, what I would always say is this far out, don't believe anyone who gives you totals, and you and I will forecast this storm this weekend right here on ABC. All right, sounds good. Could be a rough start to spring, though. Absolutely. All right, Sam, thank you. Now to the manhunt underway in Pasadena, California. Police searching for a suspect wanted for dropping a large boulder from a highway overpass, smashing through the windshield of a family car below, and a young husband and father killed because of it. His pregnant wife and four-year-old daughter in the car at the time. Here's ABC's Kana Whitworth. Tonight, a mother and wife pleading with the public for help after her husband was killed by a 35-pound boulder while they were driving on a California freeway. If anybody saw anything, please help us. Guadalupe Gutierrez was driving her 23-year-old husband in the passenger seat when police say their car was deliberately hit. That boulder did not come off the side of the freeway and strike the vehicle. That boulder was purposely moved and thrown from the overcrossing. Gutierrez pregnant with the couple's second child, their four-year-old daughter in the back seat when the basketball-sized rock crashed through their windshield. We decided to have a second child about two weeks ago. <laughs> We found out I was pregnant. <laughs> he was so excited. <laughs> now he's gone. Tom, California Highway Patrol is checking that boulder for DNA evidence. They're also searching this area for surveillance cameras as they try to find whoever is responsible. Tom? Kana Whitworth for us. Kana, thank you. Next tonight, Southwest Airlines facing questions tonight. An adult and a toddler kicked off their flight in Chicago. Here's ABC's David Curley. The passenger with the two-year-old said he didn't understand. Because she's sitting. She's been sitting in the last five minutes. The child had been crying, not sitting in her seat, but on the lap of the man who appears to be her father on the Southwest flight from Chicago. The family ordered to leave the aircraft. This is not helpful, guys. You want to go to Atlanta? Or the you guys decision's want to go been to the next made. This all happening after the jet had headed to the runway and then back. Well, we've got an incident on board, possible belligerent passenger. We're going to re be returning to Alpha 16, please. Citing regulations, the flight attendant and a ground supervisor were adamant. Former airline pilot John Nance calls that absurd. Just because somebody has authority does not mean that they need to use it in the draconian way that this was applied. In a statement, Southwest says a conversation escalated on board and the airline offered regret for the inconvenience. But the man seemed to get the last word. I'm glad you screwed up everyone saying the family was put on the next flight to Atlanta. Southwest says it's going to reach out to the customers to listen to their concerns. Tom? David, thank you. And there's still much more ahead on World News Tonight this Friday. The ski lift disaster, the malfunction, the lift going backwards. Several riders sent airborne and slammed to the ground. Plus, the Amber Alert in Mexico. Police now say a Pennsylvania teen flew to Cancun with a family